Hello, my name is Emily Springer. I am an academic trainer for the Center for Teaching and Learning, and we're very happy to have our own School of Business uh, faculty member, Dr. Edward Maggio, present for us today. And today's first, April 1st webinar, um, The Myth of Torture. And so I had talked with Dr. Maggio. He had mentioned, um, uh, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, you can ask any questions you would like in the Q&A. And then I will just um, wait until Dr. Maggio decides to do a pause. And if we have questions, we'll address them at that time. And he does have a few sections where he may want you to interact. So um, that being said, brief reminder, this is being recorded and it's gonna be posted in the CTL Live by webinar page for future reference. And I will go ahead and turn it on over to Dr. Dr. Maggio. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I do know we've got quite a bit of information to get through and uh, I don't wanna waste any time. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen so we can uh, facilitate moving this forward. So uh, always, I always, always like to make sure this is the right presentation if you're here for the ceramics lecture, you are in the wrong spot. Before we really kind of dive in, I do want to cover a couple of things. Uh, notably, the topic today does involve graphic discussions of some very unpleasant events, as well as there are some graphic photos. Uh, I will, when I can, certainly advise uh, when there's going to be something upcoming as far as a photo or discussion that may be unpleasant, uh, just to warn people. Uh, this is a discussion on torture today. So as much as I can try to mitigate the content, it is certainly, uh, as I have been read, graphic in nature. Um, also too, uh, everything I say today is my own view. It's not the view of the university or the Miller firm where I work. Um, uh, some of you who have been to my previous lectures, you do know uh, my main occupation. I generally and focused in doing terrorism litigation. Uh, that is representing victims of terrorism against nations or organizations that facilitate or engage in terrorism. Uh, notably, I have had a number of students who are here live today who've been asking me, what's my win record? And I do think it's a fair question. Uh, you know, Though I have to be honest though, my win, rec my win record's not very good. Um, if you wanna see it, I'm happy to show it to you. Uh, there it is. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see, not, not the best music, uh, apparently other than, uh, myself in the state of Louisiana, nobody likes Cajun and polka music. Now, obviously this is just a, a simple joke. It is April Fool's Day. Um, but I thought it was appropriate to kind of start off in a little lighthearted way this way, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, as mentioned before, this is April Fool's and uh, some of my students who accuse me of not having a sense of humor. This is an example, at least in my feeble attempt to show you, I'm not always serious all the time, nor do I take myself serious all the time. But also more importantly, uh, I've had to put a lot of thought into this presentation, specifically that the content, I didn't want to make it so overpowering that people either had to turn away from what we would see or what we would discuss or be in a position that they were extremely uncomfortable. Um, I've had to do a number of revisions. Uh, it was even suggested by one of my colleagues to try to throw in jokes or make things a little bit lighthearted where applicable, uh, which considering we're talking about torture, not an easy thing to do. So as an added disclaimer, I would like to say, if you can hang with me, if you can make it through as much of the presentation as you can, my promise to you, I will interject, I will do uh, my, bad attempts at, at dad humor where possible to try to alleviate, put some air in the room when things are getting to a point where in our discussions, either it's getting very intense or some of the areas we're gonna cover are very controversial. So that's my promise to you, I will do my best. Uh, this is not an intelligence lecture. This is not a legal presentation I'm doing before the Supreme Court. So I do have a degree of latitude to try to make things a little bit lighthearted where possible. And that's what I'm gonna to try to do. So thank uh, for those students who wanna see the win record, there it is. Sorry, other than that, you're gonna to have to do your research. Uh, and with that said, what is probably gonna be the worst transition in academic presentation history, let us talk about 
the United States and its torture policy as it relates to enemy combatants as used by the CIA and the Department of Defense. What am I gonna to cover today? Specifically, the reason why I chose the word myth, and I had a few people talk who wrote me long-winded emails about how torture is real, and then I had to you know, remind them, that's not the subject of this presentation. Torture is real. Where the myth as the subject of this presentation is from is that it's effective. And if anything, I hope you take away from the presentation today is that for counterterrorism and intel gathering and also for law enforcement, torture does not work. And I'm going to systematically, fairly quickly, dismantle any ideas you have that torture is an effective tool to get information from people. But I'm gonna spend the most of my focus on why we still think to this day, not just in the United States, but the global world community, why we think torture works. How do we reach that idea in our heads that this could be something? And I, as mentioned, as Emily uh, graciously noted, I will give you a chance to actually work through some scenarios with me to kind of reinforce why it does not work. So we're gonna go through also too the nature of terror cells. We're gonna go through the, the ticking time bomb scenario, which is always used by not just uh, people in discussions at, in their daily lives or at a bar when they're playing these hypothetical games, but also by professionals in the criminal justice and intel world. We're also gonna go, what are the consequences when, it, if, besides the United States, any organization anywhere in the world decides to engage in torture against people. We're gonna talk about what does work. And certainly we're gonna kind of discuss how do we get to the idea that doing enhanced interrogations would be a good idea. And I'm gonna actually propose to you, it's a cultural byproduct. And I'm also gonna go into uh, popular media and how it kind of created and led to the development of the 9-11 torture apparatus, which led to the horrendous events that occurred following its implementation. Uh, I do wanna warn you, the next slide coming up it has graphic photos. So if anybody wants to turn away for at least a minute, this would be the time to do so. I do wanna, as a starting point, make it very clear because whenever I do a presentation on torture, I always have one or two people following the seminar that want to engage me in a discussion as to, well, it, it really wasn't that bad, right? Or it's not as bad as, let's say, medieval torture under the reign of Henry VIII or compared to other countries. I wanna be very clear, this is not up for debate. Not only has the United States recognized what we did to prisoners at CIA, on, in CIA black sites and in prison camps is torture, but the global world has recognized what happened was torture, as well as the victims themselves. To try and portray this as anything less than torture, at this point, it, it, it's a non-starter in discussion, and I'm not going to entertain it. If anybody wants to put it in the chat room, anybody after wants to ask questions, I'm going to be very clear. The horrendous acts that were carried out against people are torture. It's not uh, I, I always have people, well, well, could you call it torture light? Could you torture or torture moderate? And they come up with all these creative terms. Ladies and gentlemen, the conduct that was engaged against people in US custody, as we're gonna discover and learn today, uh, was horrendous. That's not up for debate. That's not up for dispute with this lecture. I wanna focus as to how things reach this point. What is the basis of it? And also, too, what can we learn from it in the hopes that this does not happen again? Now, in particular, we know from the 2014 report, also known as the Feinstein Report, two major issues when it came to the use of torture against enemy combatants. And particularly, the idea behind using torture was essentially a threefold approach. We used enhanced interrogation, which is the, the term used instead of torture. Well, We'll get to how that evolved and developed. For one, the reason of trying to find the location of Osama bin Laden. Two, to find out if there were any other terror plots that were going to be coming following 9-11 from any Islamic terror cell or terror organization. 
and three, to get to gather general intelligence as to our threats that are something that the United States should be prepared for. Understand with 9-11, the greatest military and defense and intelligence regime on the world essentially got defeated by an asymmetrical attack by a terror cell. People wanted answers. The world wanted answers. We as US citizens wanted answers. So this program was put in place. And what we ended up learning years later, and as noted in the Feinstein report, one, it didn't yield any useful intelligence. Even movies like Zero Dark Thirty that try to portray that torture led to useful intelligence, that's a myth. You can you do your own research as to that movie or any other similar uh, popular media regarding it. The CIA basically got caught, one, doing this to people to gather useful information as they reported it, which turned out not to be useful information. And two, when they were realizing torturing people was not getting us any useful intel, they essentially had to double down and in turn report back that their techniques were being effective when in fact they weren't. And we will re return to the Feinstein report later on in the presentation. Now, let's get into some of the aspects of why torture doesn't work. Let's talk about the, the biology and the mental here. I have here information that basically illustrates the following. Yes, torture can get people to do things they don't wanna do, but it doesn't yield real information. And I have uh, some of the information from Shane O'Mara, who's a professor of experimental brain research at Trinity College. Specifically, stress, fear, pain, all of these things can cause serious damage, if not changes to our ability to recall and even discuss information. Put another way, if you torture me long enough, I'll confess to whatever crime you want me to. You torture me, you hook me to a car battery, you sleep deprive me, you put me in different stress positions. I'll confess to murdering somebody last year. You keep torturing me long enough, I'll, I'll confess to killing Julius Caesar. It doesn't yield accurate information. It just destroys people to the point that they will submit to whatever you want them to say or whatever you want them to do. In the world of intelligence gathering, that's a, a, basically a useful act to do something. From a human standpoint, it's immoral and disheartening to break a human being to the point that they literally have their mental and bodily functions are not operating as they should. So the, just to get the biology out of the way, despite what you see on, on, in popular media, that doesn't provide us any useful intelligence. But I wanna take it a step further. Let's dive into how a modern terror cell works. Let's run through a scenario, shall we? So imagine we've got a situation, we've got a terrorist mastermind, there's my little cursor, Let's say they're based in Karachi, Pakistan. They want to carry out an attack in the United Kingdom. Well, this terrorist mastermind is going to have generally a courier or an individual they trust relay information to somebody else. They're not going to be sending messages via Gmail. They're not going to be creating a digital footprint. They're going to use human actors to move information to eventually get information, in this case, in our scenario, to a terror, terror cell leader in the United Kingdom. That's going to be someone who's generally well-established, not somebody who you would suspect. Could be a university professor, could be a lawyer, could be a doctor, uh, a, somebody of, of high worth and status who would not be somebody you would suspect engaging in any type of terrorist activity. And in turn, they're going to go to work. The arrows we have here, this is essentially you know, cryptid communication, using uh, cryptocurrencies, essentially leaving an anonymous trace in order to reach out to people. And in turn, what are they gonna do? They're gonna assemble a team of people. You're gonna have a support team. This is one or a few individuals that maybe assist with travel, with lodging, with food, for anybody involved in a particular terror cell. You're gonna have B, you're gonna have the person that gets supplies. That may be somebody that gets everything from rope, to knives, to guns, anything to carry out a specific mission. We have finance. This is either somebody who's doing illegal activities or even 
legal activities in order to finance a particular operation that's going to take place in the future. And we also have, believe it or not, the social media public relations. For a terrorist event to be effective, it has to be communicated. It has to be brought out and known to the world. And you need essentially social media and PR people to do that. And lastly, before any attack is ever finally ordered by a terrorist mastermind abroad, who in turn notifies a terrorist cell leader who then gets all of these parties involved, you're gonna have an attack unit. These are people that are gonna come in, generally from combat areas, third world parts of the world where violence is taking place. They generally may do a reconnaissance of a location. They may take pictures. They may set off a fire alarm, start a fire to see how fast emergency services responds. And when queued, and they don't know when that queue is coming, they then engage in whatever terrorist attack has been planned. Why am I going through this illustration? Because the design of this is, is for purposes of avoiding sharing information, is ingenious. If, let's say, the local police grab one of the guys that's in the A unit, the support unit, all they're going to be able to tell you is, well, I had an you know, anonymous message to get a, a, a short-term rental, to rent a truck, and that's all I did. Okay, well, what about the attack? Tell us what you know. I don't know anything about the attack. Well, who, who's in the other units? I've never met anybody else. Well, who's the one that, you know, you must be dealing with a supreme leader somewhere. Where are they? I don't know who it is, and I don't know where they are. And those people legitimately do not know this information. You can torture any one individual from any of these groups, and they will not have any information other than what they immediately know or what they carried out. It's from an organizational standpoint, it is effective to keep everybody in the dark. From our standpoint in preventing terrorism, the logistics of this is, is a nightmare. So torturing people to try to get information about really what we want, which is either the cell leader or anything linking back to the specific mastermind is not gonna happen just on the nature of how a terrorist cell is set up. All right, let's get to our first audience participation point. Uh, if we can open the chat room, that would be great. So let's, let's go through the, the ticking time bomb scenario because I this is a common discussion point. So let's, Imagine this, I'm the head of the counterterrorism for the FBI. We're aware the nuclear bomb has been placed in a major American city. We don't know where it is, but we got the terrorist that planted it. A uh, bomb's gonna go off in an hour. What does everyone in the chat room wanna do? And Emily, I'm gonna need your uh, your assistance here because uh, I can't see the chat room with my PowerPoint on, so. No worries. Be um... my eyes here. And what I want to do is, is run, run away from the city. Um, oh, 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 just to be clear, this gentleman is not about to get a manicure. I just want to point that out. <laughs> Anybody has any doubts about what's what's about to take place? Oh, my goodness. Does anybody do have do, any group? suggestions of what you're going to do? It's, we're at 59 minutes. You got 59 minutes before. Nuclear bomb's going off. He knows where it is, and he's not talking. Somebody's raised their hand. Could I allow them to speak? Sure. Okay. Tina, you should be able to speak. Tina, you have your hand raised. No pressure or anything. We're just live. I know. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead until... 58 until minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this is not good, ladies and gentlemen. I have K51. You should be allowed to unmute yourself as well, too. A couple of people raised their hands. Somebody in the chat says, let them go with a tracking device on them or give them a phone that is bugged. Somebody else says, okay. one, fing Somebody else says one finger at a time. OK, um, fair enough. Um, let me see. Tina, are you able to speak? No. Okay, the hand raised thing might not be working. Anybody else want to? Oh, Tina, I think we can hear Hi, you. Tina. Hi, Tina. What would you do? You're our fifth what about caller. using sodium pentothal? Two problems. One, uh, whether it'll be effective in time, and two, is it going to be accurate? 
Okay. Thank you for sharing, Tina. I'm just going to mute so there isn't any background noise. Communicate to the law enforcement object objective observations from Greg. He said that in the chat. We'll take a couple more and then I'll, I'm going to kind of expand upon this. Okay. This scenario then, here. Let me see one more thing. Let's see if K51 is allowed to talk or not. I'm sorry, you probably don't have your self named appro appropriately there. So I'm, one more thing down in the chat. Oh, this is K51. <laughs> um, contact the media and the city division Homeland Security should be not notified. Um, Sharon says, Dr. Maggio said that there is no true reality when the person slip, spills his guts in lunch. It's a little intense, but. <laughs> All right, let's, I think that's enough comments for now. Okay. Here, here, here's the problem we have with this scenario. Uh, for those, uh, who may recognize the photo, the photo's from a movie called Unthinkable. Now, in that movie, you had a, a terrorist who plants not just one, but a series of bombs. In order to get him to talk, first they start torturing him. When they find that doesn't work, they bring in his wife and they kill her in front of him. And then they end up bringing in his children. And when they're about to kill the children, that's when he finally talks. Here's the problem with this scenario. Terrorists are not stupid. They're not going to have somebody pull a suicide mission who has the ability to have leverage put on them. Put another way, you're not going to put somebody to carry out an operation like this that you can get any leverage. They are going to be somebody who has made the decision, I'm going to die for this mission. So you can torture me. You can cut whatever you want off me. I don't have any reason to live because I believe in my cause. Somebody who is at this point, you have to realize if they were chosen by a terrorist organization, they're a complete zealot. They're an extremist. They are not interested in enjoying life. They have, they've reached a point that they are done with humanity. Pretty much any terrorist or anybody that works at the DMV. They don't like people, okay? So we could do whatever we want to this person. It's not gonna get them per se to reveal what, you know, we want them to say, and not to mention, they, these individuals have chosen for a mission of this magnitude, they're gonna be trained on how to resist. So they may give out false information. Oh yeah, it's in Chicago, or hey, it's on this street, because they know, you know they've gotta last long enough to, for essentially their body to give out or for them to die. So the problem we have with the whole ticking time bomb scenario is it's not realistic, is we could do whatever we want to this person, we're probably not going to get the information we need. So the question is, well, what do we do? The answer is it's too late in a scenario like this. We essentially have to go back to the drawing board, see what other clues, what other investigation, investigative methods we have to see, you know, how did this person enter the city? Where have they been? Let's check cameras. Let's check people they know. We have to essentially do a traditional investigation. But torturing this individual is not per se going to give us the information we want. But I will show you later on, you'd be surprised how many people think this would work, torturing this individual in order to get to this, this stage of things. Let's talk about also the fact torture we have learned creates more terrorists. And specifically, if we look at Al Qaeda, for those who are not, you may not be familiar with the old photo of him, but this is Dr. Zahari. He was a surgeon he became a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, severely tortured while imprisoned under President Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. Upon his release, himself along with other inmates and other prisoners who were under uh, in prison camps by the Soviets got together with, I'm sure you know this individual, and they put together an organization known as Al Qaeda, the base. And we have seen repeatedly throughout history when we torture people, it radicalizes them. It takes them to the next level of going from people who have a belief in their cause to then going to the point they want a vendetta and they wish to carry it out. I'll give you a more recent example. Let's take Baghdadi, leader of ISIS. Previously, a lot of people don't realize he was a PhD in Islamic studies. He was for all intents and purposes, a scholar. 
he had radical ideas and thoughts, but being put into Kambuka by the United States and going through the experience, as many of those inmates were, of mistreatment, torture, and abuse, essentially consolidated him and his cohorts that upon release, they evolved to the next level, which was the creation of ISIS. Most people don't recognize him there as an inmate, but I'm sure you've seen that photo. And I have one of the more controversial, but I would arguably say accurate quotes from reporter Martin Trulov at The Guardian. The war on terror got it wrong. The rise of ISIS based on the CIA's torture program did not, did not fight terror, it fed it. This is something now most criminal justice, counterterrorism professionals acknowledge that you torture people, it brings them to the next level. If they survive severe torture, for many people, it puts a, a streak of vendetta and anger that only violence to them is going to seem like the cure. Uh, this is one of the reasons why, for example, in Syria, which tortures people, they don't release prisoners, they kill them because they are aware if they torture anybody for intelligence, they know if they let them out, they're going to come back at the regime, which is why the regime makes sure they never leave. So what does work? Firstly, surveillance. And I want to be clear, when we say surveillance, I mean specific targeted surveillance. Uh, there's this old joke that, uh, you know, the United Kingdom and Singapore have the most amount of CCTVs in the world, but nobody's really watching them. When we do surveillance on our suspect with good cause, that yields us intelligence. Think of it this way. Most of us as kids have been caught doing something we weren't supposed to do. And the reason we got caught red handed is we were not aware that our parents or a loved one or a friend was watching us do it. The same applies if we're dealing with terrorism. We want to catch people in the act doing what they're doing to gather in information on what they're doing. We also need intel on the ground. And that means people. We need the best possible people to gather information as to what suspects that we have in our radar are doing. And it's one of those things that even now in the United States, we are getting better at it, but this is one of the best jobs for the immigrant community. I always find it interesting where, you know, I'm in the DC area and I, you know, hear about, you know, this one and that one getting promoted. Um, think of it this way. If you want to put somebody in an effective role, to gather intelligence. Let's say, let's go back to our Pakistan example. Do you want to take a guy who originally is from Nebraska, six feet tall, blonde hair, blue eyed, just graduated Yale? Do you want to put him in Pakistan? Or do you want to get a first generation immigrant who loves this country and is willing to serve, who knows that city that can blend in like a shadow to gather information, again, to support the United States? You know, to, to quote Hamilton, Immigrants get the job done. And this is one of the best areas where the immigrant community serves the United States, contrary to what you sometimes see with politicians and some of the comments they make. The third thing that works is the Scharf method. And the Scharf method is a method of interrogation. And if anybody has seen criminal justice shows that are documentary in style, such as the first 40, 48, you're familiar with the Scharf method. That's not like law and order where they're throwing the guys against the window and confess and they're, they're being hostile. Scharf method is subtle. There's a rapport. If you've ever seen the first 48, for example, uh, the, New the New Orleans detectives, they'll have the individuals sit down in the interrogation room. They'll talk to them like human beings. Hey, look, can I get you a cup of coffee? You look tired. You hungry? Steve, Steve, get him a bagel. And they talk to them. Hey, you know, we know you were there at the 7-Eleven, 7 o'clock. 7 we know you had a dispute. We just don't know your story. Tell us what happened. You'll feel much better. We need to know what your side of this is. That's a very specific, it's a very nuanced style of interrogation. And specifically now, we've had the U.S. government, and as I have here, the FBI and their high-value interrogation group has been looking on how to master that how to develop a more humane way to interrogate people that is effective. Now, the focus on this style of interrogation 
We have to give a lot of credit to President Obama in 2009, who essentially put the financing and the effort towards development of these type of programs to move us away from ever going back to doing any type of enhanced interrogation, AKA torture. And again, I wanna reiterate, the focus is on the humane treatment of people. Being very clear, we are gonna get information from somebody, we are gonna ask questions, but we're gonna do it in a way where we're respecting those individuals as human beings. Now, here's our next audience participation point. And I hoping one of my criminal justice students answers this, at least in the chat room. Does anybody know the creator of the Sharp Technique? And I hope that one of your criminal justice students knows as well. Or, or their, their background, anybody, throw a guess out. All right, so what we're looking at is the Sharp Technique. And no, don't Google, please don't cheat. That's not nice. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> Don't be like those people that cheat when they're at a, a trivia night at a bar. Like, just answer honestly. Who, anybody? <laughs> a few anybody people case? posted. Somebody said. Somebody said Jack Bauer from Twenty Four Hours. Good thinking. We will get to that. And later then somebody on. else said parenting question mark. Um, let me see here. The surprise nobody sent it. Like detective, a cop, teacher, teacher. Mm -hmm. Psychology. All right. Well, uh, I, I bet nobody saw this one coming. It's from a Nazi, ladies and gentlemen. The FBI has spent millions of dollars, countless research to study this particular Nazi. Now, I'm going to tell you this, this the story behind this individual, but I immediately you say the word Nazi you have a certain connotation in your head. This is a little bit of a different story and I will explain. It's a complicated yet very unique story. Um, and I'll be very clear on the details. We're not gonna play German Wizard of Oz. It's your good Nazi or um bad Nazi. It's complicated the history behind this individual, uh, Mr. Hans Scharf. Firstly, uh, Hans Scharf was an individual, he was working in South Africa with his family in the textile industry. He ended up, while returning to Germany on vacation, a travel ban went into effect, and against his will, he was conscripted into military service for the Nazi, Nazi regime. His wife, who was an unsung hero in this situation, was able to talk her way into the office of the commanding general because she found out her husband, Hans, was gonna be going to the Russian front which essentially would be a death sentence where he'd be cannon fodder and would be killed. She spoke to the general and let her know that her husband was fluent in English and it would be a waste of his talents in order to be sent to be killed on the Eastern front in Russia versus using his English speaking skills. He ended up, the morning he was going to the Eastern front, a telegram came in that I was being reassigned. Uh, he ended up becoming a interpreter. Then he was became an interrogator for the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. He then saw the Gestapo and the SS, how they were torturing people for information. And he made a decision that he would no longer even think about carrying out that type of program to interrogate people. He decided he would take a different approach. And that's where essentially we had the development of the Sharp Technique. If you can imagine this, you know, for downed, British and American pilots, he was friendly. He would take them on walks in parks. He would offer them baked goods from his wife. He would offer them sandwiches. One POW, POW he actually brought up on a flight in an airplane to have a discussion with him. He built a rapport. He also would not press people for information. He would just engage them in conversation. But at the same time, he would make it clear from his conversations with them that he knew everything. You know, he also would make it clear as well, it's better you talk to me because the Gestapo and the SS, those are not people that you wanna be talking to. I'm your friend, I'm willing to work with you, let's build a bond here. And he also used a very unique technique of confirmation and disconfirmation. So in his conversations with people, he may say things like, oh, you know that, I know that American plane flying over there, that, that only holds five, 
five people, five bombers. And then people, Americans or British pilots would, would correct him. Oh, no, 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 that only fits four. And doing that essentially allowed him to gain intelligence. So to put things in perspective, out of 500 US and allied pilots, he got intel out of all but 20. That's a 96% success rate. That's unheard of, even for modern homicide detectives. I even have the quote that's associated with him, which is, oh, hello. We have a look. Are you the one that's setting off alarms? Ladies and gentlemen, we found the, uh, the culprit who set off the alarm here. So let me know. Yes, it's not your part of the show. You come back later. Uh, the famous quote associated with him is a World War II prisoner said that he could get a confession of infidelity from a nun. That's how good he was. And it's interesting because he's an individual that unless you are a criminal justice researcher or you study investigations, especially if you're training to be a detective and you're studying interrogation techniques, you may not have heard about him up until this point. But interesting enough, after the war, he was invited to come to the United States where he worked for the Pentagon. He worked for the US Air Force and helping them to develop the SEER school, Survival, Escape, Aversion, Resistance. So he out actually helped save lives in his post-World War II career by helping the United States. And if that part of the story was crazy enough as it is, it gets crazier. He ended up becoming in the 20th century, one of the world's greatest mosaic artists and believe it or not, he went to work for Walt Disney World. Uh, for those who have been to the, the Cinderella Castle, you may have seen his work. Though I do have to say it must have been weird on his job application and or even in the job interview when they asked him, what were you doing between 1941 to 1945? You know, it must have been like, it's a small bird after all. <laughs> Sorry. You know, but you know, this is the work he did. It's, it's amazing. He also did the mosaics at Epcot. So let's review where we are. We had a former Nazi with a humane approach to interrogation with a 96% effective rate using baked goods, sandwiches, walks in the park. He ends up with a job at Disney World versus the CIA's approach. We tortured people at black sites and, and hidden locations. I'm not even getting into some of the international legal ramifications of taking prisoners of one nationality, bringing them to another country against their will in order to torture them. Of the people that were tortured by the CIA in those black sites, 26 of them were mistaken identity. In other words, they were picked up because either somebody informed on them as a terrorist suspect when they weren't, or we just got the identities wrong. Of 119 in black sites, 39 were severely tortured by the CIA. And that doesn't even you know, get us to the worst part, which is those prison camps, Abu Ghraib, which I showed photos in the beginning, Camp Buka, which essentially led to the development of ISIS. Those are the, the two situations we have with black sites and prison camps leading to the rampant abuse of people. And as far as abuse, just to be clear, not to sugarcoat it, physical sexual abuse, torture, rape, sodomy, and one, one murder effectively, which to this day, there's not justice for that individual's family who is in custody. So it brings us, and by the way, there's another you know, unpleasant photo coming just to warn people. Why did we rely on this as a method? We knew about the sharp technique for decades, and yet we decided to engage in torture as an effective way to gather intel. I will, uh, you know, when it comes to this topic, I've had people accuse me of being anti-government, that I'm portraying the government in a negative light. I don't think that's the case. And I'll even give a counter argument. After 9-11, how difficult would it be for a politician to go on television and say, look, we have been attacked by an Islamic terror cell. We now know they're, they're Al Qaeda. We have a number of them in custody. And uh, we're now gonna talk to them as uh, people in a humane manner, offer them care and get to know them so we can understand why they carried out what they did. For a politician, would that really sell if you were trying to pitch that to the American people? 
Why am I bringing this up? Because of the fact we forget sometimes our government is a republic. It acts based on the wishes of us, the people. We demanded justice. You know, let's be real. After 9-11, many Americans wanted blood. They let their politicians know, and in turn, the politicians followed the will of the people. So when I talk about this, I want to be clear. I'm not portraying the government in a negative light. If you want to know who to blame, we, the United States, the citizens, we have to kind of look in the mirror and take responsibility for what we did. Or when we did learn about this was taking place, if we didn't do anything to stop it. Now, my students will probably tell you, I, I tend to focus on this, but human beings, we have to admit, we are, we are animals. We are emotional beings. In the right circumstances, any of us are capable of doing horrible things. Um, when, I used to, when I began studying emergency management at NYU, we used to have a phrase, you know, several days to animal. And in emergency management terms, that refers to when you have a person who has no shelter, no food, is facing a severe crisis, there's no security, no police, no fire department, or maybe a political event has happened of a severe magnitude. Maybe there's uh, some cultural event that just occurred that has people upset. It used to be that it would take several days over time before things would escalate to the point that people would start engaging in lawless behavior. With modern technology today, we now, we don't even use that phrase anymore. It went from several days to animal to now several hours to animal. Um, last time I did a lecture for NCU, the next day, this happened. And think about what we know now, how quickly things escalated in just a matter of hours to the attack on the Capitol. So we have to be cognizant, cognizant of the fact any of us, if circumstances occur, has the potential to engage in some of the worst human contact and conduct possible. I also wanna point out for quite a long time and even now in the modern era, we do romanticize vengeance. And I give you, I'm providing here some of the top examples that we have from popular media. Uh, for those familiar with the top left here, Man on Fire. For those who haven't seen the movie, we have a character named Creasy, who's a, a retired CIA black ops assassin. He's battling PTSD, alcoholism, suicidal tendencies. He takes a job as a private bodyguard for a little girl. That little girl in turn is kidnapped and presumed killed by a Mexican kidnapping cartel. And in turn in the movie, he goes on a rampage of torture and killing to avenge her. We also have movies like Law Abiding Citizen. A gentleman comes home, his, it's a home invasion, two gentlemen rape and murder his wife and daughter. The system does not provide justice for, for him. 10 years later, he has this situation where the primary person who did this to his family, he's not torturing this individual for money. He's keeping him alive so he can literally cut him apart, take him apart piece by piece. And the movie itself, um, as I, I talk about with my students, why it's so popular, it, it's one of the few movies where you do root for the bad guy because the movie essentially is a criticism of the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system in every location, in every jurisdiction in the United States is now essentially designed for speed and efficiency. It's what we call in sociology, the McDonaldization approach. And this movie basically is one man whose family did not get justice due to the McDonaldization approach of the criminal justice system. And in turn, he's taking every part of the criminal justice system in his community to task for it. What about Taken? Liam Neeson, his daughter is kidnapped in Paris by a, a organized crime group. And in turn, he uses torture and killing to find her location and rescue her. Almost all of us who have seen that movie, you know the speech, one of the most famous movie monologues of all time. You know, I don't have any money, but I do have a particular set of skills. 
it's it's a very intense movie which by the way um it, the monologue is is so famous that you literally can do it in any voice with any character and it still sounds sound, sound scary um uh for example i like to if i'm sitting around if i want to drive my wife nuts i'll just do different voices doing that monologue monologue uh we have a two-year-old so sometimes you know, got to keep things G-rated. I'll do Kermit the Frog. I don't have any money. What I do have is a particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare for someone like you. If you don't let Miss Piggy go, I will find you. And I will kill you. Yay! It's, it's an intimidating movie with an intimidating central character. Which brings us then, we have the Equalizer. We have a retired Force Marine Con and CIA Black Ops minding his own business, discovers a girl who's being human trafficked and prostituted by a Russian organized crime group. He goes to see them at their headquarters. They mock him. And then he locks the door before he goes out, turns around and in the course of a minute, kills all the Russian gangsters. Which by the way, as a New York Italian, I have to tell you uh, some word of advice. If you are ever in a situation where you make fun of somebody and they go are going out the door, then stop lock the door and turn around, you've got a problem. Uh, to paraphrase comedian Eddie, Eddie Griffin, in a situation like that, there are two things you need to consider. Either one, they've got a bomb strapped to themselves, or two, that's a bad individual and things are about to go down. Neither of which is good. Then we get to, of course, John Wick, a guy who engages in vengeance because he, as a former hitman, his dying wife, who's dying of cancer, gave him a puppy, which in turn, Russian gangsters kill the puppy. Now, I remember seeing this in the movies and you can kind of like, you can look around in the audience and you could tell who the cat people were because the pat cat people would be like, that's a little too much. He's killing all those people for a dog. And then you'd have the dog lovers be like, no, that's right. You know, like this guy here, this is your time, right? Can you imagine if someone killed this little guy? Would you want vengeance? John Wick wanted vengeance. He had three movies now at this point, killing over a thousand people, uh, essentially. And it all started with the dog. These are all characters that are archetypes. They're all force of nature characters. They're unstoppable. Going back to Creasy from Man on Fire, there's the scene where he's got the family of the head of the kidnapping cartel. And the brother is tied up and Creasy's on the phone with him. He goes, oh, your brother wants to talk to you. And he hands the phone to him as he shoots his hand with a shotgun, blowing off all the fingers. And the ex-wife who's there picks out a big stack of money, throws it down in front of him. And he's screaming on the phone, I don't want your money. I want you. You hear me? I remember in the theater, somebody was quiet for a few moments and someone yells in the theater, hell yeah. These characters are first... In purposes of literature, of classical Greek and Roman mythology, they are the personification of nemesis, a righteous infliction of retribution manifested by an appropriate agent. We find these characters, you know, fascinating, but they are problematic. They're seeking vengeance, and vengeance is generally done for individual and selfish purposes. There's an old Chinese saying, if you're going to do vengeance, you should dig two graves, one for the person you're going to kill and the other for you because you're either going to get killed doing it or your soul is going to be killed. But is there a way for vengeance to be done so it benefits the greater good? And it brings us to my next point. We actually can look at popular media and characters for this answer. In particular, you have the Punisher who has this famous quote. In certain extreme situations, the law is inadequate. In order to shame its inadequacy, it is necessary to act outside the law. To pursue natural justice, this is not vengeance. Revenge is not a valid motive. It's an emotional response. No, not vengeance, punishment. What is the purpose of this? I know some of you are like, why are we spending all, the time, all this time on movies and a comic book, Professor Maggio? Well, understand, after 9-11 immediately occurred, the intelligence gathering apparatus we had, the criminal justice system in place at the federal and state levels were not designed to address asymmetrical warfare from an organization such as Al Qaeda. 
My proposition to you is these type of archetype characters, these archetype themes, the idea of doing vengeance, not on an individual level for an individual benefit, but for the greater good, for the greater good of society, led to the development of the enhanced interrogation program. What is my basis? Where can I show this connection? How about the Department of Justice? Specifically, Deputy Assistant Attorney General John Wu and Assistant Attorney General Jay Bybee, they drafted the torture memos. This essentially was the legal basis for giving the CIA, the Department of Defense, and the president the legal authority that these type of, quote, enhanced interrogations could be carried out against people. This is where we got the idea that we could do the mental and physical torment, keep people awake for as long as possible, keep people listening to heavy metal music for 36 hours straight in the dark while blindfolded and naked and cold, waterboarding, stress positions, all of this done for the greater good in order to address a problem that the legal system right now cannot address. It's also, I also want to point out, part of an expansion of presidential authority, which brings us to the unitary executive theory, the idea that the president in times of crisis has unlimited power to do that which is necessary to save the United States. Now, for those of you bringing up 24, now this is where we get to the 24 discussion. And as I mentioned earlier, the ticking bomb, time bomb scenario is it's a fallacy. It, it's a construct that A, would not happen because terror, terrorists would not choose people to carry it out that have something to live for that you could get leverage over them, or they would be prepared to suffer and die without giving you up any, any information. But the idea of enhanced interrogation, it had a massive supporter. And I wanna see if you guys can figure out who this is. He once said, Jack Bauer saved Los Angeles. He saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Then talking about season two, where we had that ticking time bomb with a nuclear bomb this in California. He then further said, are you gonna convict Jack Bauer? Say that criminal laws against him. You don't think he, you, you, have the, you think you have the right to a jury trial? Is any jury gonna convict Jack Bauer? I don't think so. So the question is really whether we believe in these absolutes and, and ought to believe in these absolutes. So this is somebody saying, look, the Constitution, the criminal justice system, in a situation like this, where we're dealing with a nuclear weapon and terrorism, it really doesn't apply. Surprising enough, who said this was just Justice Andin Scalia of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, as an attorney, I, I have, I'm problematic with a viewpoint like this, to be like, well, sometimes you know, maybe the Constitution and the criminal justice system wouldn't apply here. So remember that Senate report we talked about? This is where I connect it all together. We know from the Feinstein Senate report about the enhanced interrogation that the CIA admitted their operatives based what they knew would work based off the show 24. So I want that to sink in again. We carried out a system-wide enhanced interrogation program on inmates, on suspects based on an archetype character that I described earlier. And in this case, Jack Bauer. That, that should you know, wake you up a little bit. That, that's a moment for pause. We did severe torture. We, by torturing those inmates at Kambuka, helped create ISIS, all based off applying something that was from a character in a television show. So where do we go from here? I always like this quote, even though researchers now say it was more of Benjamin Franklin addressing the Pennsylvania Assembly in relation to a tax issue. But his famous quote, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. It, it is true. We, we cannot engage in activity that violates the Constitution, that violates criminal justice laws for the sake of trying to get information, whether it's a criminal justice local situation, whether it's intel gathering on a terrorist cell. 
And I also want to point out the reality of terrorism. And this brings me to my next point about target hardening and emergency response. Uh, I get a lot of questions asked me about, well, how do we prevent terrorism 100%? I, I want to guarantee there won't be terrorism. The answer is there is no guarantee. The only thing you can do to deal with terrorism is either target harden. In other words, try to do what you can to either catch it before it happens or makes it, make it harder that if something does happen, you can uh, be able to survive it. This is situations where even what we do now, programs like see something, say something. Uh, if we have government buildings, we try to put up uh, cement barricades so nobody could drive a truck and set off a truck bomb. Why we engage in practices and how we protect our information, how we uh, avoid uh, revealing too much about ourselves. We can target harden. We also can develop better emergency responses. How EMS, how our firefighters, our paramedics respond to a situation, how we communicate, how we look at a whole picture when a mass casualty incident occurs. That's really the best we can do. We cannot stop terrorism. There's no 100% way to stop terrorism. As I mentioned before, the greatest military on the planet, the United States military, the greatest intel gathering service, the CIA, the NSA, could not stop 19 hijackers engaged in low-tech asymmetrical warfare. We can only make ourselves be able to be difficult to be victims of terrorism or to respond to it when it happens. As I find, you know, wrapping up here, we can't give up our constitutional principles, but we also need to be vigilant when those principles are being violated. You know, for all these situations with, with Camp Buka, with Abu Ghraib, with CIA black sites, there were people who felt that they could not report what was going on. There were CIA officers, there were people in the military that they weren't per se doing torture, but they knew it was happening and there was no way for them to report it. It takes all of us a concerted effort to ensure this does not happen again. We also have to be able to be strong enough to say, hey, look, I see an injustice and I need this injustice to stop. It's not easy, um, but it's something that, you know, we have to watch what our government does. It's also our right, by the way, as citizens. We voted them in office. We get to know what they're doing. We have to ask tough questions and we have to not keep our heads in the sands, but be aware of what is going on with our country and what we're doing abroad. And with that said, I always like to provide my information. Uh, questions generally are welcome, uh, if they're good questions. Uh, <laughs> and I have my email contact and my phone within reason. Please don't call me. I'm on Eastern time zone, 10 o'clock at night, because you want to have a discussion on aspects of torture. Uh, I do need my sleep. And with that said, I think we can now open it up to question and answers. I was going to say, I have a couple if you have time for it. And I do apologize um, for the, uh, this is Mr. Tiki, by the way. Yes. 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 Mr. Okay. Tiki. Setting off alarms. Yeah, I was like, what was that? I did hear beeping, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, let me see. Um, Carolyn wants to know, what about the Geneva Convention that states we do not torture? Is that null and void since 9-11? We just didn't follow it. That's part of, the, part of the reason why, if you look at the Geneva Convention, it applies to citizens. So the argument was made, well, many of these combatants, they, their own countries have revoked their citizenship, so they're not citizens. If they're not citizens, Geneva Convention doesn't apply. Ergo, fair game. Okay, thank you. Um, Tina wants to know, would not reporting it if you were part of the military and saw it happening make you a whistleblower like Snowden and end up costing you? Well, today, I mean, the good news is there is more mechanisms for reporting it, but it's also not that simple because what if you're in a situation where, you know, I'm a, I'm a private and I know torture is taking place. Me reporting it, I potentially could be at risk for violating state secrets. I could face treason charges when I'm trying to do what's right. Um, it's an area that, I'll be honest, we need more improvements for in terms of whistleblowing in this area. It's, uh, 
Yeah, I know. I get a lot of questions about Snowden, which, you know, that may be the topic of the next lecture. What what he did, was that treason? Was it not? If um, there's enough interest, I'll certainly, I can cover both sides of that. Um, but in short, in summary, it has gotten better for people that are involved in national security and military operations if they see unlawful activity to report it. But it's not absolute. There are situations where, unfortunately, the laws of, of in place would require you to essentially run it up your chain of command and not divulge anything public. And then I have a question about the Sharf method. I know we've mm -hmm. talked a lot about um, examples of rom romanticizing revenge, but someone mentions um, what is the best example of the Sharf method in popular movies that you could think of? Or maybe they oh, take a, a different approach. Yeah, I don't know. Just Maybe if you can't answer I'll be honest, I can't even think of it because think about it, we watch movies, it's it's confrontational, it's uh, you know, in your face. It's that's why I, my wife doesn't let me watch Law and Order because when they're like beating up a suspect every other week, I'm like, you you can't do that. Like, <laughs> you know, like it's it's not I mean, I can't even I'm trying to think of uh oh, that's a tough one. I can't think of a movie where it's like, so would you like a cookie? <laughs> right. So like, tell us what happened. Yeah, yeah, in a nice way. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a good question, Todd. So if you if you come up with something, let it's us more know. Like, I want the truth. I know what you did. Yes. Yeah. You that's killed those I'm... five people. You're gonna talk to me, or I'm gonna. I know, and somebody did talk about like, oh, is that kind of like good cop, bad cop kind of thing? And so I think there might be like slivers of sharp <laughs> tactics in there. But anyway, um, good question, Todd. And then let me see, um, can vengeance be justified as punishment? Um, there's a slide that talked about that. Can vengeance be justified as punishment? It's a comic book explanation. In, it's just in theory, the, well, think about it. We can, we can explore this. Okay. When we, in the past, when a state government executes somebody, well, isn't that murder? Well, no, because we're not doing it for a selfish reason. We're doing it for the benefit of, quote, the community, of the people. When the death sentence is handed down, it's the people versus that name defendant. The, the problem, though, is that when you, you could take that too far, and that's kind of what I was going with with the idea of justifying torture, the idea, well, we're punishing that individual, not on an indi we're not torturing them as punishment for them on an individual level for the benefit of let's say the fam uh, one family member, we're doing it for the benefit of all people in our community. <laughs> and by the way, I, I want to point out: look, the I, I'm not the CIA, the NSL, NSA, the FBI. They keep us safe. You know, we're human beings. You know, let's we realize what we did is wrong. We we've come up with ways to do things better. Our goal now is to make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, it's a uh, I'm also not somebody, I want to be very clear, I'm not, uh, when it comes to terrorism, I'm not, quote, soft. I'm not one of these people that thinks, like, we can hug it out. But we do also have to ask ourselves, who is the enemy and why are they the enemy? Um, I remember after 9-11, there was all the, well, they hate us for our freedom. They hate us for our freedom. Well, we know now they hate us because we were in their countries. It happens now, for example, when we sell arms to Saudi Arabia, and they then use it in the Yemen civil war and a bomb is dropped and it kills kids. And we, people come to claim the bodies of their loved ones and they see USA on the bomb material, they're going to hate us. You know, these are honest discussions we have to have, you know, why do things reach this point? You know, there's right. foreign policy implications that happen that we have to acknowledge and we have to have the honest discussions. Yeah, and I absolutely do appreciate um, your insight and your expertise and your knowledge in this area. And I know that everybody in the participants and our audience members just are thankful that you take the time to share the information mm -hmm. with us because it is about having an honest conversation about it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we can look at that through different lenses as we've discussed. Um, previously, but I want to thank you so much um, for your time. No, my pleasure. And, and um, I thank all the participants for coming today. And uh, again, this is going to be posted in our CTL webinar um, page.
page. And if anybody needs any questions or follow-up, feel free to reach out to either Dr. Maggio or myself. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Okay.